Nina is a professor of animal science, um, of animal welfare at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Um, she specializes in dairy cow behavior and welfare. Um, and I'll hand over to you now, Nina. Thank you, Jenny. It's, um, first of all, I have to extend a very, very big thank you to Derico for inviting me over and making it all possible to come to the UK for what's a pretty speedy trip, three days. Uh, as Jenny said, we had the opportunity to work together a little bit when she was in Canada, so it really is not just a great pleasure to be here to talk about some of the research that my students have done, but also just to meet up with old friends again. So it's been great. So over the past two days, um, I've been, it's been so much fun because I had the opportunity yesterday to have uh, nearly the whole day discussions with dairy producers. Um, we visited a farm. And so it's been a, a great way for me to get a bit of a feel for the British system, British dairy system, uh, the UK's, the, dairy system in the UK, which hopefully by the end of my uh, presentation you'll see that for me it's been exciting because it's not that different from the Canadian system. So what I want to do today is give you a little bit of a feel for where I come from and what our approach to cow comfort research is and a little bit of a story about where we started and where we are now. So the UBC Animal Welfare Program, um, we're funded almost entirely, well half of our funding actually comes from the industry. So it's the Dairy Farmers of Canada that have basically put a lot of money on the table and they're the ones that have funded the research. And sorry, I can hear, I, I can hear there's a feedback now. <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> Um, so the Dairy Farmers of Canada have put their money on the table and really about 10, 15 years ago decided that you know, they, there was pressure towards the industry about coming up with science-based best practices and I really do have to thank them because they put the, uh, their trust in us to start working in this area. Of course, because we're funded by the dairy farmers, we need to have practical methods for improving the health and welfare of dairy cows. If we come up with methods that are not practical, um, you know, they're never going to be adopted. So it's, I often say to our students, because we are in partnership with the dairy farmers themselves, it, we really need to stay honest and it needs to be a collaborative approach. So my plan today is to talk a little bit about some of the cow comfort, the basics. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of research over the last 10, 15 years, so I'm going to highlight a few of the, of the specific experiments. Uh, obviously, we've only got about 45 minutes um, to, because we want to allow some time for questions. I can't go through it all. But what I want to do is then move from that to basically the work that we've been doing on commercial farms. And you know, as somebody who's had the privilege of working in the dairy industry as a scientist, you know, you'll see our students have done all these really great research studies. And I often stand up in front of farmers and would say, well, you know, your cow should lay down 10 to 12 hours a day. And rightly so, I get these blank stares because that's all great information, but what is the farmer going to do with that information if he has no idea what the lying time is of his cows on his, on his uh, farm? And likewise with something like lameness. We know um, and the industry has embraced that this has been something that they embrace the fact that they need to deal with it, that lameness is a huge problem. And again, how are you going to fix something if you don't measure it? So that's basically a bit of our mantra is that you know, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So what we did in terms of the translation from um, the basics, we went on farm. So I'm going to walk you through some of that. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the risk factors that we've come up with. So first of all, this slide, it just highlights um, a basically get, hopefully give you a bit of a feel for that we haven't come at this whole on-farm assessment without some background knowledge in the area. We've had tremendous number of hardworking students working on 
just the stall itself. So looking at stall management, the design, sort of the hardware placement, how wide should the stalls be, where should the neck rail be placed, and then also just the stall surface it, itself. So I've just listed a series of the studies here. So just to give an example of one of these studies, this is looking at uh, deep bedded stalls. So this is a picture um, from our own facility. We have deep bedded sand stalls. And I think, in, you know, this is the perfect stall. The, the students that did this was Michelle Drizzler. She'd, got, um, she'd gone and she'd raked it absolutely flat. And, you know, in an ideal world, it would look like this all the time. But we know that it doesn't look like that all the time because and we hope it doesn't, because if it doesn't, we, that would mean that cows don't use it. But cows obviously walk into the stall, they go through the whole motion of laying down, and what happens over time? Well, you get a little bit of digging out. And so we're interested in the question of did it matter what the stall looked like um, to the cow? And did it matter whether or not it was dug out? And so what Michelle did is she raked the stall, and then she, we had a grid that we put over top of the stall, and she actually measured uh, how much the stall had been dug out. So here on the slide you see this is what a day three stall looks like, a day six stall, and a day nine stall. And so the darker the shading, the deeper the hole. So by day nine, what I often say to people, it's like a bathtub. It's, so that's only about 8 to 10 centimeters down, which you don't think really matters that much. But what Michelle did is she then applied these as treatments to pens. So we, in our uh, research farm, we have the ability to use pen as the replicate. And so we have lots of these small pens with 12 stalls in it. So every day, she would go in twice a day, and she would make the stalls in those particular pens look like either a a control stall, which means that it was uh, day zero, or a day three stall, or a day six stall, and a day nine stall. From the cow's perspective, it looked like this. So she, like I said, experimentally varied the shape and the depth of the stalls. And then we asked the cow, how does this impact her lying time? Well, when Michelle did this study, <laughs> she had to, um, we actually made her do it twice, because the the results were just so perfect that we thought, no, it just couldn't be. Something must have gone wrong. So here we see on the y-axis lying time in hours per 24 hours, and along the x-axis is the decline in bedding in centimeters. And in the second experiment, we actually took it out even further to nearly 15 centimeters. And what you can see is that it mattered to the cows. It's a linear decrease, so as they the bathtub got bigger in the stall, we saw a reduction in line time. And what this works out to is basically every, for every centimeter decline, we lost 10 minutes of line time in those cows. So one of the recommendations that I say to farmers is, you know, bedding maintenance, how often do you do it? And we may get somebody that says, you know, once a week. And I said, well, if you can go twice a week, I mean, preferably every day, um, but if you can try and slowly increase the amount of times that you go to maintain your beds, the cows will thank you for it. And, and they'll pay you back in terms of increased lying time. Okay, so that's just an example of how we've done some of, of the uh, stall maintenance work. And I'm just going to walk you through another experiment. The other area that we've done lots and lots of work on is this whole issue of lameness from the my colleague Dan Weary and his student Francis Flower, they had done some work on how to locomotion score the cows. Um, we'd done work on hawk lesions, flooring surfaces, and also identifying how high risk cows. And then we'd done a series of experiments um, looking at the interaction between housing and lameness. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of those now. So one of the questions that we have, we'd asked is this whole issue of does housing matter? And I grew up in the beef industry. And you know, we, didn't, we definitely don't see this lameness to the extent, um, at least in the cow-calf industry, that uh, we do in the dairy industry. And so we were interested, what was it about pasture that, you know, was there something special about pasture that um, affected lameness in cows? 
so we had a postdoc from Mexico, um, Omar Hernandez Mendo, who spent nearly a year with us. And we designed an experiment where we took groups of lame cows. So we gate scored all these cows and we took the, the uh, mean lameness score of the group was and in our system, we have a one to five system, which is slightly different um, than I, my understanding is here. But basically, three is clinically lame, fours and fives are severely lame. The average gait score was three. So we had some cows that were two and a half, some cows that were three, some cows that were three and a half, um, a few fours. For ethical reasons, we didn't take any of the fives. So what we did is we had 18 groups of these cows, and we took nine of those groups, and we kept them housed in the free stall. The other nine groups, we took them and we put them outside on pasture. I mean, they were brought in twice a day to the milking parlor, they were provided TMR in the morning and the evening, but we, their primary housing site was outside on, uh, on pasture. So then what we did is we, loco we locomotion scored them every week. And what we see here is um, the locomotion score there is one to four, and we actually went to five, but as I said, we didn't have any fives. And then along the y-axis is the, the weeks of the, the experiment, one to five. So what you can see is that those cows that were ax housed on pasture within three weeks, we already saw um, an improvement in gait. And we had done lots and lots of research on different um, things looking at trying to improve lameness, and we'd never seen such a dramatic improvement in lameness. The cows that were housed in the freestyle, we see essentially stayed the same, maybe a slight increase. So our first reaction was, well, it must be because they're lying down longer outside. So we'd actually had um, electronic data loggers that we'd put on the legs of the cows, and we were able to look at how much time they were spent standing and lying down. Cows on pasture lay down less than cows indoors, and by about an hour and a half. And so here is the lying time hours per 24 hours, and then the two treatments. And so this was really interesting because it wasn't the fact that they were spending more time on their feet. They were actually spending less time on their feet. And so we were thinking, well, what is this? I mean, clearly in different types of climates, and my, the climate in British Columbia is very similar to the climate here. I mean, there is no way that we can keep cows outside on pasture during the rainy season. Um, it's the cows, I mean, we've done other work, they don't want to be out there. So we have about 150 kilometers between, located between our research center and our offices in, in the city. And it gives us a lot of time to think. And I remember Dan and I moved driving back from the farm and we looked at these results and we kept saying there's something about the pasture that seems to work really well from a lameness perspective. And in an ideal world, you know, what we need to do is learn from those experiments and these findings and how do we then look back at the intensive house system, system and how do we tweak that in order to take advantage of the good things that, that we learn from these types of experiments. And so upon reflection of the freestyle environment, you know, where in the freestyle environment is it the same as, as the pasture? Well, the only thing that we could come up was up with was the cubicle or the freestall. I mean, it's for the most part soft, it's dry, um, and so we thought, well, maybe what we need to do is we need to figure out how to give the cows a dry, soft place to sand. So we set up the next experiment using the same idea by thinking, okay, what we need to do is figure out how do we manipulate that standing surface. So when you look at the freestall, we have this thing called a neck rail. And the neck rail is placed, usually it's there primarily so that the cow indexes herself, goes in, and when she gets up, that she doesn't stand four feet in, like the bottom picture um, on the slide because the chances are that she's going to defecate in the stall. And for a long time, we've been very worried about dirty stalls because of the mastitis problem. So Jose Ferganozzi is a colleague of ours um, that we've collaborated with extensively from Brazil. He came up for a sabbatical, and we did this experiment where we looked at manipulating the neck rail position and to see how that affected, first of all, the, stand, the line time and then also the standing position. Lying time essentially is not impacted by the placement of the neck rail. 
What the neck rail does is it changes how she uses the stall for standing. So here on the y-axis again is hours per day and on the bottom is the neck rail distance. And we did what we call a dose response experiment. So 130 centimeters is super aggressive. There's no, very few cows could actually stand with four feet in the stall. And then we went in 15 centimeter increments all the way up to 190. And we call the 190s effectively no neck rail. I mean, what we did there is we pushed the neck rail as far forward as possible. We couldn't actually take it off because the type of um, loops, stall dividers that we have require the neck rail there to keep them in place. So when you look at the results here, what's really interesting is, first of all, let's look at the black squares. Those are two hooves in the stall. And not surprising, with a neck rail that's super aggressive, we get lots of that behavior. So the, the cow in the top picture, she can't move with four feet in, but she's standing there with two feet in. And as we make the neck rail less aggressive, you see less and less of that behavior. But what you see, based on the bottom line, is a corresponding increase in four foot standing in the stall. No, you're probably wondering, well, why, don't, why didn't the four feet go higher than that. Well, a big determinant about how the cow uses the stall for standing is her size. So the big cows, even at 190, couldn't stand with four feet in, but we had a greater proportion of those cows that were able to um, do that behavior. So we knew the neck rail was a way of manipulating the stall, so what we then did, uh, this, the, the cubicle for standing, so the next experiment that we ran was looking at the neck rail placement. And this is just a picture of our facility where we looked at the neck rail, which, um, and we just did the two extreme experiments. The neck rail at 130 centimeters, as in the bottom right-hand corner, and then no neck rail, which was the 190. And if you can look up, you can see how we manipulated that, because we replicate a bunch of tree, uh, across pens. So what did we find? So when we look at standing behavior, we see that, again, we basically replicated what we had done with um, the previous neck rail experiment. When the neck rail was in the aggressive position, we see lots of two-foot standing and virtually no four-foot standing. Uh, and then when, with the 190 or the no neck rail treatment, we can see that we significantly reduce the amount of two-foot standing and increase the four-foot standing. So what did this, you know, how did this change lameness? So in this case, what we did is we actually did a crossover design. So we did used exactly the same experimental setup that we had done in that original pasture play uh, experiment, where the average lo uh, locomotion score was three. Half of the treatment groups had the neck rail, the other half didn't. And then five weeks uh, after the end of the fifth week, we switched the treatments so those that didn't have a neck rail got a neck rail, and those that had a neck rail um, were then given no neck rail treatment. And what we saw was exactly the same thing that we'd seen in the pasture, just not quite as strong. So, but those cows that had been, were lame, where we then took the neck rail away, showed an improvement in gait. And to us, this was incredibly interesting because here we were able to learn from nature but now take this and overlay it on the intensive environment. Does this mean that every farmer should take the neck rails away? Well, it doesn't, you know, what we need to do is we need to also worry about the other things. You know, the reason that we have the neck rail there is because of cow cleanliness. So we actually measured that. And yes, without the neck rail, the udders were slightly dirtier than with the neck rail. But again, this is, you know, depending on the management of the farm, you have to determine, you know, what, what are your challenges? And, you know, if you don't have a big mastitis problem, I would strongly encourage somebody to think about making the neck rail less um, aggressive. The other thing to do is if you have lame cows and you need to give them a place to recover, well, many farmers have sick pens, well, what about making a lameness pen? And in that lameness pen, take your cows that are uh, that um, have are clinically lame and move them into an environment where they have a chance to recover. 
We also um, looked at, there were 72 cows in this data set, and it was never set up to study mastitis. Um, when we published the paper, we were pushed to actually report some of this data. So we went back and we looked at the effects of this neck rail study on the lameness, the new cases of either lameness or indicators of um, utter health. So when we looked at the number of times that a cow, when she scored two and a half, so not lame, one week, and she was lame the next week, that would have been considered a new case of lameness. In the case of the neck rail treatment, we had 11 new cases of lameness, and the no neck rail, we had two. This was highly significant. We looked at mastitis, and again, you know, I encourage somebody to redo this experiment on, on a longer-term scale. We had saw no change in, in um, mastitis. We did look at somatic cell count those times. We had milk tests on these cows. How often did a cow show a milk test that was in excess of 100,000 cells per mil and as a pre-clinical um, indicator of mastitis? And again, no difference. So, you know, if I had to put my money on this, I'd bank on lameness here. I know that the neck rail can um, impact lameness. And with, especially in farms where you have elevated stall management, it works really, really well. Um, so this was something that we, we thought was an important finding in that it really gave us an idea of how we could practically try, start to look at trying to manage lameness on farms. Okay, so on farms, again, we're still challenged with the fact that, you know, experimentally we had done all these things, but, you know, the dairy industry is, uh, you know, farms vary for a thousand and one different reasons, and again, how is a producer going to manage lameness, manage his facility if he doesn't have information on his cows on his farm. So what we did is we were very fortunate to have two unbelievably hardworking students. Um, Kiyomi Ito, who's originally from Japan, had um, was doing a master's with us, and we have a visiting scholar program, and the young woman on the right is Alejandra Berrientos, who's a veterinarian from Chile, who came for an internship um, as a visiting scholar. And so we were fortunate to get some money from our local um, nutritionists and a few companies in our area to take all of this basically you know, innovative research and go to what we call the application side of things, was to go on farm and look at you know, what was the lameness scores on these farms and how could we come up with intervention plans for the producers. Um, so that was British Columbia. and then. At the same time, um, we also, or shortly thereafter, we also were approached by a large company in the United States who had heard that we were doing this, and then were interested in going on farm in the United States. And there we were able to visit about 40 farms in California and another 40 farms in the northeast um, of the United States, New York, Vermont, and Pennsylvania. In this case, so for Kiyomi, the British Columbia data was her master's project, and Alejandra, who originally came as a visiting scholar, she came back, and this, the American side of this was her master's project. So I'm going to, um, I've, we've pulled these results now, and I'm going to walk you through some of the things that we found out. What they did on these farms was for, um, facility design and management. So we went onto the farms. We had a general questionnaire that the farmers asked were asked, and with things uh, questions like, at any point during the dry period, did your cows have access to pasture? In terms of the pen that we assessed, we asked the farmers to identify their high group. So we did one pen on each of these farms, which was the high group. Um, at that time, none of those cows had access to pasture. In California, some of those pens had access to an exercise lot. Uh, in British Columbia, they didn't have any access to pasture. We took all the measures of stall design, um, the type of bedding that they use, where the dry matter of the bedding. We looked at measurements of the feeding space, of the water trough, their milking management. Was it, one, uh, was it two times a day milking or three times a day milking? All that type of information. We also locomotion scored the entire high group, um, 
just to give you an idea of how many cows are in this data set that I'm showing you, there's nearly 18,000 cows that have been gate scored. Alejandra and Kiyomi did a lot of gate scoring. We used our system um, of one to five. Um, it was all based on live observations, so we didn't do any video recording and then look at uh, the videos afterwards. And obviously doing 18,000 cows, they, you know, we had to do something that was practical, which and thus we, we relied exclusively on live observations. We classified the cows one and two were not lame, three, fours, and fives were clinically lame, and then we also uh, separated out those cows that are severely lame. Severely lame cows, I mean, most grandmothers can pick out severely lame cows. Um, the threes are a much bigger challenge, but the severely lame ones, we also wanted, to, um, most of those cows need an, an intervention plan right away. So we wanted to give farmers feedback um, differentiating between clinically lame and severely lame. Just to give you an idea of the farms, by region, this is just a graph um, showing that the mean herd size in British Columbia is about 170 cows, uh, and the range in the farms that we looked at was from 71 to 500 cows, and not surprising to most of you that have looked at the dairy industry in the U.S., as you go south of the border for us, farms get much, much bigger. In California, the mean herd size was about 1,800 cows. Uh, the range was 450 to just under 6,000 cows. Uh, and in the Northeast, which was um, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and New York State, mean average herd size was 825, 26 cows with the range from 190 to 2,800. If you recall, I said we only did the high group and one pen, so we've also reported this on, in terms of group size. Average in British Columbia was 94, just over 200 in California, and 150 in the Northeast. Barn age didn't vary across regions, with the average ranging between 12 and 16 across the three regions. Okay, what did we find? So this is now the percent cows that have, were diagnosed as clinically lame, so those are the threes, fours, and fives, and each of the, the blue diamonds represents one farm. So what's really interesting here is that, you know, this, I mean, these are all freestyle farms, and what this shows us is that there's tremendous variation within a region, and in case of British Columbia, so we had some farms that were less than 10%, and unfortunately some farms that were like 60 or 70% clinically lame. So what did this look like um, when we went south of the border? This is California. Um, the average in California was 31%. Um, the average in British Columbia was 28%. And then the Northeast. Everybody hold your breath. <laughs> The average lameness in clinical lameness in northeastern United States is 55%. So this is um, again, I think the, one of the take-home points here is the fact that in each of the regions, and even in in the northeast, we have some farms that are doing an unbelievable job. And I think we, as a dairy industry, we need to learn from them. What are they doing well? The other thing that to remember is the fact that, you know, in most, within a region, most farms get paid the same amount for milk, they, labor costs are about the same, feed costs are about, are, um, about the same. So what this benchmarking approach does is effectively what it does is it takes economics off the table when it comes to trying to to show that you know best practices can be done and can result in improved lameness. When we look at severe lameness, so these are the cows that your grandmother can pick out. What we see is that um, the region still struggled. California did much, much better than the other two regions. The average severe lameness in California was about 3.5% compared to 7 and 8% in British Columbia and, then, and New York, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. Okay, so one of the things that we're um, that we were also interested in looking at was within, sorry, within a region is identifying the risk factors. So 
you know, what is it about those farms that had low levels of lameness that we could, that were common among them? So, Nuria Chapinel is a, an epidemiolog epidemiologist, so I can't even say the word. Um, she came and she um, is trained in this, and so we started looking at the data. And what we found very quickly is that we couldn't pull by across regions, that we needed to look at the data within region. So one of the things that came out was in the northeast is that deep bedding, those farms that had deep bedding, and a lot of it was sand um, or deep bedded sawdust or deep bedded, um, we also saw a lot of composted manure, deep bedding, those farms um, reduced lameness by 50%, it had a huge impact. So. Just to give you an idea, the other farms, so the, the top 50%, were much more likely to have mattresses or rubber mats. And so, you know, if you, the, one of the things that you can do to help reduce lameness is if you're in a position to, that you already have sand, that's great, or if you're in a position that you're going to be looking at changing some, some of your stall design is to move to a, some sort of deep bedded system. Obviously, sand also has benefits in terms of um, reduced mastitis, um, so there is huge common, uh, huge benefit for us um, in terms of sand deep bedding. But that may vary by region and accessibility, but any sort of deep bedded system. We also saw that those cows, those farms, sorry, that had access to pasture sometime during the dry period reduced their lameness by 50%. How that is, we're not sure because those cows, when they were actually locomotion scored, were in the high pen and they didn't have access to pasture. But again, there was something about um, having access to, to pasture during the dry period. And remember, we only asked them this as a yes or no question. You know, at any point in time during the dry period, did they have access to pasture? Farmers asked, asked either yes or no. And so that could vary. Some may have had the entire dry period outside. Others may have only had the far off period. We don't know that for sure. But there was something about the pasture that was really cool. Um, so um, one of the things that we do know, you know, when we're looking at trying to do lameness is that training is hugely important. Um, there's some work out of Minnesota and um, one of the great lameness researchers who happens to come from your country, Becky Way and company, it also showed this, that those, that training makes a big difference. So in this case, this is Marcia Andres' data that showed that when they went into, uh, onto farms and they asked farmers to identify the lame cows on, those, on their farm, on average they identified about 8% of those lame cows. And then what they did is they provided training and all of a sudden lameness scoring went up to 24%. So that's one of the things that we're really pushing for is that farmers um, you know, many, many farmers know how to body condition score. It's routine business. Well, we hope that, you know, in time we get locomotion scoring or mobility scoring, however you want to call it, to become part of routine management on farms. Okay, the last little bit that I want to talk about is hawks. Um, this really, I think, is an in the skin lesions are injuries that really for the large part have gone unnoticed in the dairy industry. When we were on the farms, um, you know, there's we put 125 farms uh, just in the freestyle data set, the girl, the Kiyomi and Alejandra would ask them, you know, do you have any appreciable problems on your farms? And some of them mentioned lameness, but nobody ever talked about hawk lesions. So we use the, um, the lameness or the hawk scoring system that was published years ago by Cornell University uh, with ones being clean hawks, two being some measure of, of uh, hair loss and three there's some appreciable swelling or lesion. We know from our own work that stall design uh, matters for, for, um, for stall that stall design matters in terms of hawk lesions. My colleague um, Dan Weary, this is before I joined the university, had done some work where he had gone on to 20 some odd farms in our area and he'd looked at the type of bedding or stall base that they had and, and then looked at the proportion of cows with lesions. 
And so here the, the farms were differentiated by those with deep sawdust, those with um, mattress, and those with deep bedded sand. And what you can see here is again that the mattress farms really struggled when it came to hawk injuries. So, oops, sorry about my computer doesn't <laughs> We're just, we're just, oh, now it goes. So here now is the data, um, again, the same farms that I used, that I described previously in terms of the um, lameness, now we've, we're, we're looking at just the hawks. So percent of cows with hawk lesions, so these are now the twos and threes, and the farmed along the bottom. So this is British Columbia, on average, 42% of the cows scored had some sort of hawk injury. This is California, which we're up at 56, and again, take a deep breath, this is the Northeast. The Northeast, on average, had 81%. What was interesting is when you look at the severe hawks, California actually came out really well here. They were less than 2%, whereas uh, the Northeast, 5% of those farms had severe hawks, and British Columbia had 4 so one of the things that, again, we did this risk analysis, and what came out really strongly here is deep bedding again. Farms that had deep bedding reduced their hawk lesions by 95%. was tremendous. So we're continuing to work in this area, um, but one of the things that I want to do now is talk about how do we actually implement change. So part of this entire program of going on farm was giving farmers back their evidence. So this is, um, and you can do this in a number of ways. This is just an example of Novus, the company that we've been working with in the U.S., what they've done. So these are individual reports that are confidential to the farms. Um, and they, our idea is that by giving bet producers back their evidence, that they can start making um, management decisions that hopefully move their farm to uh, a situation where they can start managing for lameness, managing for hawk lesions. Our recommendations is that they sit down with their nutritionist, their veterinarian, their hoof trimmer, anybody that has um, a stake in the basic care of those animals to sit down and actually work through the data. What we did is we, we benchmarked them. And so in this case, this is just an example of the benchmark. So within a region, we showed the sort of the lowest 25% to the highest 25%, and they got a circle about where their farm was. It was really fascinating because in California, I had the opportunity to be on a farm that was one of the best farms. So he had less than 5% lameness. And we were sitting down and going through his report, and it was so cool because he kept smiling. And you could see he was so proud of himself because he had less, I think he was at 4.2% lameness or something like that. And you know what his first question to me was? Is how do I get down to zero? And I thought, you know, this is so great. First, you know, he deserved a red ribbon for being so great, but it was, again, all of a sudden he knew where he was at. I also had the, um, I also visited with one of the worst farms in California, and he was close to 65% lame, lameness. And in all honesty, he had no idea. He was so genuinely shocked at the state of um, the lameness on his farm. And... You know, he had a long ways to go, what, and as I said earlier, you know, economics wasn't on the table. And it wasn't because he couldn't complain to me the fact that he wasn't getting paid enough for milk or that feed costs were so high because he could see that other, his colleagues within the same region, there were some that were doing a really, really good job. They were getting the job done. This is just an example of what, what the data looked like from the lameness. Um, so this is, you know, the low of 5%, the high of 89%, and this particular farm that we've highlighted here had 50% lameness. And we split out between uh, clinical lameness, which are the threes, fours, and fives, and the severely lameness. Um, and in this case, you know, there's nearly 12% of those cows that, you know, anybody anybody would be able to identify. So we also gave him information on his stall design, what the average, you know, where his, um, so for instance, how often did he bed his stalls? 
And, you know, we also benchmarked him there. So what was his average and how did he relate to his colleagues? So for us, this last piece is going to be instrumental in order for an industry to start tackling um, a thing, a, a injuries, hawk injuries. We've also done work on knee injuries, which I didn't present today, but looking at trying to get a handle on lameness in these things. So what's super important is that we engage farmers. We need to help them identify the problems on their farm. And then we need to develop solutions. And farms vary for a thousand and one reasons. And, and this is where I think the solution lies in the management team that works on that farm for them to work together. Because the solution on farm A may be very different than solution on farm on farm B. So coming up with you know, industry-wide solutions, you know, in some cases we know that there's things that really work. So for instance, deep bedding. But in other reasons, it may be slightly different. On, uh, and you may need a different solution for farm A, like I said, compared to farm B. Only then will we be able to change practice. But what's really important is that we realize or we accept that this is not just a static thing. It needs to be dynamic. So, you know, I was on a farm this morning, and this individual, every two weeks, he's locomotion scoring his cows. I mean, it was unbelievable. That's so fantastic. But he's somebody that he says that his lameness, since he started implementing this, is going down because he's got all that information, and he can come up with a proper plan. Okay, so, and, oh yeah, now I remember, he only was down at 3.5% lameness, which is like unbelievable. He deserves a red ribbon for that one. So that's the end of my presentation. Again, I'd like to comment on the fact that none of this work would have been able to be take place without the dairy farmers themselves, the Dairy Farmers of Canada, also the BC Dairy Milk uh, Association, WestGen, which is one of our local genetics breeders who um, has really feels that overall cow comfort, it's worth their while to invest money in that um, because there's, you know, their general industry they're worried about. Um, Pfizer, the beef industry also supports the work we do because every dairy cow ends up in the beef system and Alberta milk. Thank you, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Nina, thank you so much for that really insightful and informative talk. We actually have oh, lots and lots of questions. <laughs> so um, the first question I'm going to ask um, is what is bedding depth? So what we've done is anything greater than eight centimeters was considered a um, deep bedded. And those and we didn't see any difference in in, um, we, we looked at those that were really deep, deep bedding, so where we had, this is, I think it's more like 15 centimeters of deep bedding between those and those that were 8 and 10 centimeters. There was no difference. The reason that we chose 8 centimeters um, is a lot of barns that are retrofitted, that where they've ripped the mattresses out, and then they've piled sand in there. The, usually what you see there is about 8 to 10 centimeters. So if they had that, they were considered deep bedded, and we saw that they, they were able to capture the benefits of deep bedding. Okay, we have another question. It's actually asked, from your point of view, do you think there is a relationship between hawk lesions and lameness? But perhaps we should ask the question, what does the scientific evidence tell us? Yeah, so it's a great question, and... Um, I actually looked at that a while ago because somebody asked me, and um, I was sitting around a table with, um, many of you may have heard of Nigel Cook, um, he's a great lameness researcher from the United States, and we were coming trying to figure out whether or not we should, in, in these assessment programs, do we really need to measure both hawk injuries and um, uh, lameness, and what and Nigel, his first reaction was, no, no, we only have to measure lameness. So then I went back, and unfortunately I can't remember what the R squared was, but basically it was low, and it took me about three seconds to convince Nigel that we needed to do both hawk injuries and lameness. And for the farms with the lowest lameness cases in California, did they also have the lowest hawk lesions? Um, I can't remember that. No, they didn't. Um, I, 
No, I, I mean, I better say I can't remember for sure. One thing that was interesting about California that I didn't bring up in the presentation was that we never saw a mattress in California. So in California, it was all deep bedded. And what, was, what California did tell us, and I didn't have time to present that, is when we looked at the risk factors in California, what came out was stall maintenance. So that, and stocking density came out. So when stalls were um, in the hawk injuries, when they remember the bathtub scene that I talked about, the greater the bathtub, the more likely that they would have um, hawk injuries. Um, do you um, have some information or recommendations for what size the stalls or cubicles should be? Um, I can. We can email those out. I mean. We, because I can't remember, I mean, we want, it's difficult to say off the top of my head, partly because one thing I noticed here is that your cows are slightly smaller than our cows. So I think yesterday on that farm that was only 3.5% lameness, he had a 46-inch stall. We, with, so we're, we try to go with, in North America, we're trying to actually push for 48 or 50. He was making 46 work, obviously, really well from his perspective. So it varies. One thing that we do know is that all the hardware in the stall is for our benefit. So you put in a brisket board locator, you're going to reduce line time. Okay, there are so many questions, <laughs> um, and I'm just working from the bottom of the list upwards, so I apologize if your question doesn't get asked. Um, but one question is, why do mattresses increase hot lesions, Nina? Okay, the problem with the mattress is that it's, um, and we see the same thing with rubber mats, is that it's abrasive. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people put mattresses in thinking that they can get away without using bedding. And even though, I mean, there, was, there is research, and we've done some of that, that you can um, control to some degree hawk injuries by putting lots and lots of bedding on your mattress. The problem is, is that it's really hard to keep it there, and even those farms that try really hard um, invariably um, struggle to keep it there. We, do, we did notice that there was significantly more hawk injuries um, in the Northeast than there was in British Columbia, and we have a lot of mattresses in British Columbia. The difference between those two systems is the amount of bedding that was used. In the Northeast, there was virtually no bedding. That said, you know, even those farms that do use bedding still had more hawk re, um, injuries than those farms that had deep bedded. So what I often say, you know, a lot of times farmers are in a situation where they just don't financially can't rip out their mattresses and put in, in deep bedded systems. So I would say, look, hopefully in the long term you want to use deep bedded and when things get better you can do that. But in the meantime, make sure that you use lots and lots of bedding. But it's going to cost you. But, you know, it's the same time we know that there's evidence now that even the hawk injuries are painful. So how much bedding would you recommend on top of a mattress? You're not going to like my answer. <laughs> we feel about, you know, seven and a half kilos on a mattress, so it's not insignificant. Okay. Um, what other questions do we have? Um, we will email out uh, stall recommendations. Lots of people are asking. Yeah, I mean, I, what I'll do is we'll give a link to a website that Nigel Cook has put a really good website together. And that's where all of those things will be in there. There was one question in terms of moving the neck rail. Can it, in, if you move it too far, can it increase instability within the cubicle? And how would you manage that if you were looking at to move your? Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm not a, a barn engineer, so I can't really. I mean, obviously, in our case, we couldn't take it away because that's what we wanted, and it was going to create instability. Um, but you'll have to just work with your own barn engineer on that, um, on for that type of uh, issue. Okay, I think we've probably coming up to, to time now, so we've covered all the questions. Oh, I'm sorry, I talked too long. <laughs> and the questions um, that we can probably deal with at the moment. Yeah. Um, 
but I, I just have one more for you. In terms of your follow-up improvements to, to, to the farmers, um, did you go back to investigate to see if any of them had actually made any improvements based on the information that you shared with them? Yeah. So, um, yes, we've done, and, and this is something that's an ongoing commitment that we're doing with this company together, primarily in um, California and the Northeast, is looking at, you know, the efficacy of the interventions. I mean, two things that came out of the farmer-based study. One thing that I have to comment on is the willingness by the farmers to participate in the study. We had, by the time we started in California and the United States, by the time we got to the Northeast, we only had enough time um, and budget to do between 40 and 50 farms. We had over 80 farms on the waiting list wanting to be participants in the study. In terms of the intervention, um, I spoke with one farmer who had much higher lameness than he thought he did. And once he was trained up a little bit by Kiyomi, he all of a sudden realized that he was missing all these cows. And when we looked at his facility design, he had very, very short stalls. And he had a situation where he had an 8-inch, no, I don't know what that is. It's probably, what, 20 centimeters or something in concrete brisket board. And you could see, and he also, in addition to lameness issues, he also had a huge problem with swollen knees. He hemmed and hawed because one of the recommendations was, well, maybe you should do something about this brisket board. And for years he'd been taught that the brisket board's really important because I would need the cow to index in the stall. So his son came back from university and the son finally convinced him to, well, let's just in part of the pen take out the brisket board. So they did. They jackhammered it all out and they filled it all with bedding. And the farmer was said to me he just couldn't believe. For one week, the cows fought like crazy. There was so much aggression in the pen. And what they were doing was all wanting to, to lie down in those particular stalls. So over time, he took out, he said it took him a month, but he jackhammered the rest of out. Yes, he has to increase his stall maintenance, but according to him, his milk went up five pounds. So he was a happy man. Okay, Nina, we're definitely okay, running sorry. out of time now. And to those questions we haven't answered um, via email. And um, I would also just like to bring your attention to another webinar that Nina is running at 7 p.m. this evening on transition cow management. There's only a handful of places left on it, and um, so please feel free to join up and join us at 7 p.m. this evening. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to one other thing. Dairy Co are having a research day on the 27th of March at the University of Reading's Dairy Research Farm. And this day is about showcasing the research that we are currently funding. So please come along and hear more about the research that we're doing. But I would like to sincerely thank Nina for an absolutely excellent presentation. And uh, hopefully some of you will be back later on this evening. Okay, goodbye and thank you.